Welcome friends to Soulful Spinning. My name is Lisa and this is my channel on YouTube where I share my creative adventures with all things fiber and all things wooly. Welcome to the last episode of the Winter Breed Study 2023. Sometime before the holidays this last year in 2022, I purchased a 12 breed sampler box from Hearthside Fibers and I threw in an extra to make a baker's dozen. And every Friday for the past uh, 12 weeks, I have been spinning a breed a week. So in the sample box, you get mostly commercially prepared comb top. There were a couple of rovings in there, uh, but most of it was commercially prepared. About 25 grams or you know, a little less, about an ounce. And this week's breed was Merino. So there's a playlist with all my breed study videos um, under the channel and you can check them out. Next week I'm going to do a su summary of all the breeds. I'm going to pull out all my finished squares. So every week after spinning the yarn, mostly on a spindle, I spun all of them on spindles except one. I, I cheated and went to my wheel. I spun them all on spindles, either Turkish spindle, drop spindle, or support spindle. And I've knit them into these squares, um, mostly the Berlin Blanket by Kate Davies, which is a beautiful little modular blanket that has this leaf motif on it. Most of my squares are about six by six. Some of them are a little smaller. Some of them are a little bigger. So um, once I get more squares knit up, I have many other fibers to experiment with. I will uh, put them together in some sort of crochet. I think I might crochet them together and maybe adding crochet stitches around the edges of the small ones and sort of patching them together like a patchwork quilt. So I'm excited about that. So yeah, so this week's breed is Merino, which is uh, probably the most well-known and famous wool in the world. And as uh, Deb Robeson and Carol Acarius say in their book, a Fleece and Fiber Source book, it is the royalty of, of, of the sheep breeds. Uh, there was a lot of information that I was really going into the rabbit hole of Merino because Merino is not a one-dimensional one one breed sheep. It has dozens of strains and varieties uh, in many places of the world. And so, and they, they also vary widely in micron. So I'm going to talk about that today. Mostly uh, this episode will be about what I've learned about Merino. Uh, I'll give you an update on my, um, well, I have been working, actively working on two things. I've been working on a swatch cap uh, for a jumper that I want to make. And I've also been knitting on a pair of socks. Unfortunately, I haven't made all that much progress on those two projects, but I will do I'll give you a brief update a little bit later. But yeah, mainly I'm going to talk about Merino, how I spun it, and some of my impressions so far. So I hope this finds you well. Today is actually no longer winter. It's March 24th. We celebrated the spring equinox this last week, but I'm still going to call it the Winter Breed Study because it's the final episode. And here comes my puppers. You gonna come down and visit Peaches? Peaches is my uh, Springer Spaniel Poodle mix. And she's an old girl. She's gonna be 14 in May. So she's, she's 13 years old already. And she's doing pretty good. She takes her uh, couple mile walkies every day and uh, she's, she's still doing pretty well. And I know a lot of you longtime viewers of the podcast uh, know Peaches pretty well because she usually makes a cameo in all the episodes. I hear her tap, tap, tapping over there upstairs in the kitchen. There she comes. All right, let's get right into it, it, Merino. Really, it's it's almost a daunting breed because uh, it's just so there's so, there's a lot of information about Merino. But I'm going to share with you things that I found out about Merino today. I started out um, just going. I go to the internet and I look at various resources about the different breeds every week. And then I consult uh, my Fleece and Fiber source book uh, quite a bit. Um, the authors here have a, a great spread on the Merino family in this text. I really do kind of see this as a textbook. Uh, the section on Merino is, is really a wealth of information, as is all the other breeds in the book. So I use the Fleece and Fiber source book as one of my sources. And then I also 
I use this book here is one of my favorite books about wool. It's uh, Clara Parks' uh, Knitter's Book of Wool. Unfortunately, I don't own a copy of this book. This is my local library's copy. It's out of print right now and it's exorbitantly expensive. So I just keep taking it out of the library and uh, you know, when, I, when I want to refer to it. So I got some information about Merino out of that book as well. So Merino is a breed of fine wool sheep and it's originated in Spain, known as early as the 12th century. It's a well adapted to semi-arid climates and nomadic pasturing. Uh, they can vary in size. Uh, one of the things that's pretty uh, famous about merinos is their folds. They have, most of the merino strains have lots of folds in their skin and they have a lot of follicles per square inch and they create a very, uh, they grow a very dense fine fleece that uh, tends to get weathered at the tips but because it's so dense and thick the uh, staples in the fiber next to the skin, the skin of the body is quite clean and usually white they're very high grease, and one of the things I read a lot is if you're going to hand process merino, you need a good scouring agent, and you need to do it very carefully to get all the grease out of the fleece. If you don't get all the lanolin out and the fiber sits around for a while, the residue can sometimes uh, redeposit. Uh, for example, if you wash it in not hot enough water, some of the lanolin will get rinsed, washed away, but some of it will redeposit as the wool cools off. It's going to like reattach and it's going to be really sticky. I actually know this from my own experience. I've washed fine wools before and I've put them in storage and then when I go to uh, work with them, they're sticky because uh, in my inexperience of scouring, I didn't get enough grease out. So yeah, I, I think though, if you process the wool right away and you wanna retain some of that lanolin in there, you can, uh, but don't, don't let it uh, sit around for too long in my experience. So yeah, so s through selective cross, uh, crossing of merinos, merinos have served as the foundation stock of many, many useful breeds. So as we've seen in a lot of the breeds that we've just studied, uh, we looked at Polworth, uh, Ramb Brambolet, Targhee, Cormo, CVM, they all have merino uh, heritage. A fun fact from this westernrise.com website says a merino sheep have a 360 degree field of vision so they don't have to turn their heads to look around. I don't know, I don't know if that's something that all sheep have but I thought that was interesting and uh, my husband said that it's because they're prey animals so they can see sort of behind them and they also um, the merinos much like targi and rambolet they have a good flocking instinct so they stick together uh, to protect them from predators they can produce up to 227 pounds of wool in a lifetime uh, in the 15th century spain's thriving wool industry uh, and trade uh, financed all the expeditions of its conquistadors including christopher columbus who came from a family of wool traders. So I have a little bit more of the history of the breed in um, the coming up pages here, but I thought it was interesting. So Merino is not, uh, let's see if I have my one book here. So most people think, oh, Merino, it's just this really fine wool and it's, it can range anywhere from uh, 12 to 26 microns. So there's quite a wide variety, and in the book here, the Fleece and Fiber book, um, the authors talk about the whole Merino family, and they have uh, different uh, strains. So they have a page on Delane Merino, they have a page on Deboulet, they have a page on Saxon and Charlay Merino, they, uh, and then they have just some general information about um, Merinos in, you know, in general. So yeah, so 12 to 26 microns. So what I read is that when they do commercial grading, they have uh, four categories. So they have strong, medium, fine, and ultrafine. And the ultrafine and fine are the ones that are mostly used in apparel. And then the, the, I guess the stronger ones, you know, maybe they're used for other things. Uh, yeah, it was, it's been a little confusing because if you think about you think merino is not going to be uniformly the same degree of softness uh, depending on your source and, and what uh, strain that it is. So Australia is, pro is the leading producer 
of Merino. Merinos were developed in Spain and they were introduced in Australia in 1797. And uh, according to Woolmark.com, Australia's Merino in, uh, world has the most advanced wool industry uh, with a workforce of over 20,000 wool classers who prepare Merino for the world's processors. I have some data on where the wool goes because it's interesting, you know, who exports the wool, who imports the wool, and you know, where is the wool going in the whole you know, commercial industry. I got some information about that too if you're, if you're interested, hey, hang in there. Uh, according to sheepandgoat.com, Merino is the most important breed of sheep in the world. 50% uh, of the world's sheep uh, population are Merino. And Merinos were developed in Australia and they comprise more than 50% of Australia's national flock. Uh, they are the largest exporter of wool um, of about 65% and most of it going to China. The best quality goes to Italy. So Italy is famous for its ability to process fine wools and a lot of times you'll see wool. Uh, I have a skein here that I picked up at my local yarn shop today as part of an acquisition. And this is a superwash merino and it was made in Italy. So Italy is, is famous for its uh, woolen industry and textiles as well as fashion and everything else wonderful. So the, yes, originated in Spain during the Middle Ages. Um, the wealth of Spain was based on fine-wooled merino, and they were a protected resource, a capital offense to export. So yeah, you could get killed if you transported merinos. Not that some weren't snuck out, probably, at various places. Interestingly, I found out that in the United States, the first merinos were imported to Vermont in 1802. And by 1837, there were more than one million sheep in Vermont. So you Vermont shepherds, I, uh, there's not that many there now. There, today, Vermont has about 20, less than 20,000. But uh, the Vermont flock peaked to 1.8 million in 1840, but then collapsed thereafter due to like a boom bust of the wool market. So, so there was these uh, periods of merino mania. Uh, and it struck again, Merino uh, mania struck again in 1860. Of course, uh, the woolens were needed for uniforms for the Civil War. So yeah, Merino mania. <laughs> I found out all kinds of inf interesting information. Uh, let's just give you some general information about, about the wool here from my book. The fleece weight ranges from six and a half to 40 pounds averaging 9 to 14 pounds uh, it, and it usually yields about 50 percent so after washing so if you buy a pound of raw merino you could expect to get about 50 percent of usable you know yarn which is something to think about if you're buying merino for a project you want to make sure you know you realize that you're going to lose half of it to the uh, to the sink and from you know any vegetable matter that might be in the fleece it ranges from 11 and a half to 25 microns, most falling between 20 and 22. My sample was a, a gray sample, and I think I think this came from Ashland Bay because I've seen this sold on other websites. It's a gray wool, and I'll show you the card. So gray merino top from non mule said sheep. I'm not sure if I said that correctly, and I actually didn't do any research on the mules 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 sheep. I think it's this uh, very cruel thing they do to merinos to increase their fiber production, and I I don't know I was too cringe. It was <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really want to read up on read about that, but this is from non um, M U L S E D sheep. It's 23 microns, and the staple length is three. So yeah, so 23 microns. Here's the staple. Actually, this was this is about three inches. This is just some that I couldn't spin. That I saved. It's pretty, very beautiful gray, gray color. So yeah, right in that range, uh, most of it runs between 20 and 22, so 23 microns. Uh, I, don't, I didn't find the, it's soft, uh, but it's not super, super soft. This is my in-progress square. I'll show you this in just a sec. Um, 
almost across the board, uh, they, uh, in terms of preparing uh, merino for hand processing, I so said just use a lot of care. Use a good scouring agent. Uh, use fine tooth carding cloth, uh, fine combs. Uh, they also recommend washing uh, merino by the lock. And uh, Margaret Stove, who is a New Zealand uh, spinner and knitter famous uh, for her fine merino uh, spinning, has a video that I purchased a while ago before Longthread Media was Longthread Media when it was just Interweave Press. And she has a video where she takes the locks of the super fine Saxon merino and washes it with a bar of soap and washes each of the lock individually. And then she demonstrates how she spins this gossamer yarn on her Ashford traditional, which, I mean, she doesn't really use any particularly fancy high accelerator wheel or anything. She uses uh, Ashford traditional in the video. And I've got on order her book about uh, hand spinning and processing fine wools. I was lucky enough to find a used copy on a used bookstore. So I just uh, placed that order. So yeah, upcoming, I'll be talking about that book. They are bred mostly for their wool, though um, some merinos are bred for meat and wool. Most of them are bred for their wool. Uh, they're a slower growing sheep, so the lambs gain weight slower than uh, most meat breeds, for example, and because they're growing this beautiful, lustrous fleece. Rams have long spiraled horns that curve around their faces. Uh, they're long lived and they can breed out of season. And there's a particular strain of merino called the, it's got a funny name, it's called the Barula. And it, it uh, boasts multiple births, so it can have more than one lamb. So I thought that was interesting too. Everything that I used for my research, I'll, I'll put links to in the description box. And if you want to go take a look, uh, you can go ahead and take a deep dive into merinos as well. Uh, they're still raised in the United States, uh, however, Rambouillet is more popular in the States. So Australia is really, Australia, New Zealand, and I believe South Africa, or South America, are the main uh, exporters of merino wool. As a matter of fact, I found out from the Observatory of Economic Complexity, which is OEC.world, uh, in 2020, Australia exported 62.9% of their of wool, South Africa 10.5%, and New Zealand 9.7% overall. Uh, and number four was UK, and number five was Uruguay. So, the those uh, in terms of the um, world market as as a whole. And interestingly enough, the importers of wool, I guess. Can you guess who's number one? Yes, China. China takes in 66.2%. Uh, India, 7.15%. 7, 7 and Italy, 4.35%. Followed by Czechia and the UK. So somebody asked, uh, somebody I think from down under was saying, uh, I see the sheep, I wonder where the wool's going. Well, your wool, most of it is going to China for processing, which is not really a surprise. So yeah, when you think about the fine wool category uh, from CVM to Cormo, Polworth, Rambouillet, uh, Rommeldale, Targhee, they all have merino, uh, merino bases. They're, they're all crosses with merino. So merino really is the king of the fine wools or the queen of the fine wools. So, so they think that uh, Spain received uh, merino rams from Morocco. I guess I was reading that Spain is separated from Morocco just by eight miles. It's the Strait of Gibraltar. And in the 12th and 13th century, Spanish royalty imported rams for, from the Beni Marines, which was a Berber tribe. And they crossed these African rams with Spanish ewes and developed the merino fine wool sheep. And it was named Merino after the tribe. So by the Middle Ages, you know, throughout the Middle Ages, Spain, it really had a corner on the market. And again, there was a death penalty for anybody that exported the animals out. 
But in the 1700s, the Spanish monarchs began giving breeding stock to other European courts. Of course, they were all related. You know, they were all some sort of Habsburg <laughs> in some, some fashion. So they were exported, and again, they were exported to, even to North America in the 1790s. It was William Jarvis, who was a Vermont native in the Council to Portugal, who brought 3,500 U.S. Uh, uh, sheep, uh, merino sheep to the U.S. in 1809, which I referenced earlier. There's a famous merino, uh, Shrek the, sh the Sheep, which hopefully I'll find a picture of. And he was a, uh, Shrek was a weather who escaped. He was at, uh, on the South Island in New Zealand, and he escaped shearing for six years. And in 2004, his fleece weighed 60 pounds. So he kind of uh, escaped shearing because I guess the landscape's real mountainous and craggy, and he he just escaped the, the shearing blades. And I read the article. They said that they had to use old-fashioned shears to to uh, shear him because they couldn't use they couldn't get down to the skin to get the fiber off. And actually, you guys, my husband who is the most tolerant and wonderful man in the world because he puts up with all this. He bought me something uh, just kind of as his novelty. <laughs> I think it was a Christmas present. And I opened it up and it was this. I guess he was, uh, these are uh, an ancient pair of sheep shearing scissors that uh, the design has not changed all that much when uh, people that still hand shear, I guess have, or not electric, have something similar. I mean, these aren't, these aren't um, they're not real sharp or anything. They're more of just a conversation piece or decorative item. But I, I was thinking when I read about, when I read about Shrek and how, um, I, guess there, I guess there's a video of him being uh, sheared. I'll try to find that and link it below, but yeah. These are an old-fashioned pair of shears, so I'll never have any sheep to actually shear, but my husband gave these to me uh, as a gift, so it just goes to show how, uh, how much he gets me. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about my spin. I spun all my singles on two support spindles, and I used, I'll show you the spindles I used. I used these two, and you can see this one still has some fiber on it. I guess I didn't do a good job of dividing it into two equal pieces. And I used this little, I got this little, um, it's like a bean bag with a spinning surface on it. And I used this. I, I don't know if I have any footage of me spinning this or not, but I'll see if I can find it. I might have deleted it by accident when I was getting ready today. But um, I spun it from the fold because um, the fiber was... Uh, when you're spinning on a support spindle, uh, it's best to have a woolen prep because it's uh, long draw, so you don't have as much control over like the drafting zone. And so I, I just took a staple length and I folded it over my finger and I spun. This is a Texas jeans spindle that I had in my stash, in my corral, and you can see what a beautiful spinner it is. Very lovely. And then uh, the other one I used was this one. This one's a Crivelli spindle from the Republic of Georgia. And this one, Dee, who runs the shop for Crivelli, uh, is a lovely lady. And she, um, she works with craftsmen in her country. This one's a little bit heavier. It's got a beautiful, beautiful spin. Can you hear it? Let's see if you can hear it. So um, the Crivelli spindles have a very um, kind of a robust feel. This one is quite light. I think probably about 1, 1 1.2, 1.5 ounces. But it has a very sort of sturdy and substantial feel. Yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite uh, happy uh, with these spindles. It's the perfect uh, length too, it's not too tall. 
So yeah, so I spun these up. Let's see if I'm still in frame. I'm still in frame. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I spun them on the two support spindles. Here is my in progress. I'm sorry to say I didn't get very far with my spinning. As a matter of fact, I just finished spinning and plying last night and it dried overnight and this morning I got up and I started, um, I balled it up and started knitting. So here's my yarn. Uh, it's wool and spun so it, it has sort of that fuzzy quality to it. See the fuzz? It's got nice elasticity. Not as much as Targhee but I think this is, you know, more of the the stronger merino. And then here is my the beginnings of my square. And I'll finish this while I'm editing and I will insert I will insert a picture of the completed square. So this my, my this merino is 23 microns. I uh, I would say it almost has a medium uh, medium feel. I have some Coradale and CVM in my stash that feel just as soft and maybe even softer. So I think depending on what you want to make, you can, you can source super fine merino under 20 microns for next to skin wear, baby, uh, baby items, uh, uh, you know, camisoles, underwear, um, really fine shawls. But I think if you're going to make a sweater or anything more hard wearing, you'd probably want to look at more of the, the, the stronger merinos. But again, it's all going to be soft because uh, merino has low micron. So what makes uh, wool itchy is that, well, a couple of things can make wool itchy, but one of the things is micron. So a micron is one millionth of a meter. And the higher the micron of the fiber, the, the, less, bend, um, the less bendy it is. And so the fibers can poke, creating that prickle. So uh, depending on how it's spun, you know, you can have wool that, that feels prickly to the skin. Uh, and some people are more sensitive to the prickle factor than others. Um, you know, uh, men seem to be less susceptible, according to my, my research. Uh, when you're hot, uh, can be more itchy. But they also said, I also read that the reason that a lot of people think they're allergic to wool is because of the processing and the dyes and the chemicals they use to process commercial wool. So in, um, in Clara Park's book, she talks about this process called carbonization, which is uh, basically they subject the wool to sulfuric acid. And they basically bake the, the vegetable matter out. And that's why I think with uh, some commercial preparation, you're going to get sort of this processed feel. Yeah, what did she say? So twigs, burrs, and other vegetable matter need to be removed. So for commercial processing, they use a process called carbonization, which comes into play. The wool fibers are soaked in sulfuric acid, dried, and then baked. Any vegetable matter turns to carbon dust and falls out. So that explains a lot why when you hand process, you wash your fleece at home with a, and you handle it gently, you're going to have a totally different experience. So. I'm not saying I'll never work with commercial top again because I do I do like commercially prepared top in some cases, but yeah, hand processing really is the best to to have that. It's it's like the difference between you know baking your own bread and buying a loaf of Wonder Bread at the store. It's it's just like a totally different experience. Or you know making steel cut oats at home versus using something that you just microwave in the in your oven. Let's move on to. Uh, from my bookshelf this week, and then I've got a little I've got a little acquisition, and then we'll call it an episode. So I've got a couple of things from my bookshelf this week. So one of my longtime viewers uh, asked me if she could send me something in the mail, and this week it arrived. And this is an addition to my bookshelf. And it's Betty Hochberg's book, Spin, Span, Spun, which is fact and folklore for spinners. 
And Lori, thank you so much if you're watching. Thank you for sending this to me because, it's, of course, it's right up our alley, right? And what it is, is it's just filled with lore and history and from all over the world about spinning. Fairy tales, uh, silk, you name it. Uh, quotes. Uh, here's, the, here's a quote from Exodus. Uh, and all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and purple, and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. Exodus 35, 25, 26. Now, those who raised sheep for its wool usually feared the presence of nearby black sheep, since accidental crossbreeding could contaminate the snowy white fleece of their flocks. Even today, we refer, we refer to an undesirable person as the black sheep of the family, which of course now, you know, as hand spinners, we love, we love, uh, we love colored wool. But uh, yeah, I won't read this to you, but um, I thought I might share with you a couple of tidbits um, every now and then um, in the episode. And actually, there was a couple of references to Merino in here. So here's, here's one of the references to Merino in the book. One of the most expensive meals in history was eaten by Andrew Craigie, a Scotch-born colonist and sheep breeder in Massachusetts. A friend in Boston sent him three purebred Merinos from Spain. Mr. Craigie, not knowing that they were prized breeding stock, valued at $1,000, slaughtered and ate them. And the other reference she has to uh, uh, spinning in Merino is here on page 49, where she says that the Romans spread the knowledge of spinning and weaving to every outpost of their far-flung empire. They crossed Italian sheep with Colchian sheep, named for the island of Colchis, where Jason found the fabled Golden Fleece, to produce Tarentines. They later took the Tarentines to Spain and bred them with native Spanish sheep. From these sprang the Merino, which has become a standard and the foundation for breeds all over the world. For centuries, the wealth of Spain rested on the Merino, and they were carefully guarded. Death was the penalty for anyone except the king, who tried to take Merino out of Spain. When anyone married into the Spanish royal family, it was understood that several Merino breeding sheep would be among the wedding gifts. It was not until the defeat of the Spanish Armada by England in 1588 that Spain was forced to sign a treaty agreeing to send some Merinos to England. However, the Spanish delayed sending the sheep until 1765. Twenty years later, Spain sent some breeding stock to Louis XVI of France. This began the Rambouillet breed, which we talked about last week. The King of Spain also gave merinos to the Netherlands. The Dutch East India Company took them to South Africa. An Australian bought 16 of their offspring, and the huge flocks of Australia are the descendants of these merinos. So... So I have this book, and then I also have this one from my, I had uh, picked up a, a long time ago. This is a hand spinner's handbook. Both these books uh, were published, I think, in the 1970s, yeah, mid-70s. And I think at that time, there was sort of a resurgence in textiles. Um, I seem to recall my sisters doing macrame, and, uh, you know, there was just a lot of uh, hand, handcraft movement at that time, embroidery, you know, we used to embroider things on our denim jackets and so on. And the Hand Spinner's Handbook is a really a nice book for a new spinner. And uh, Betty is a, a big proponent of long draw spinning and uh, has a lot of information there. Uh, very strong opinions by her. Um, of course, she, she also recommends that you, um, when you, after you wash your hand spun, you weigh it with weights, which uh, most people don't do that anymore because it's not a good idea. But, but yeah, a lot of information about fiber and spinning in this book. And they're just sort of neat things to have, um, you know, to peruse from time to time. Uh, I'm always looking for vintage information on spinning. So, yeah, if you have any uh, spinning books that really uh, influenced you and you'd like to share with us in the, in the description, under the description, please do come make a comment. Like, what are your favorite spinning books? Um, so going from the 1970s to those vintage books, I uh, also picked up a couple of uh, ply magazines this week from my local yarn shop. 
I'm lucky enough to have a little yarn shop, and it's in Griffith, Indiana. It's called Spin and Yarns, and the proprietress, Jamie, has a wonderful selection of wools from all the way from acrylic to indie dyed and, and everything in between. And she also is a carrier of Ply Magazine. Uh, when Ply first came out, I did have a subscription, and I believe I have the first four issues, but uh, left my let my subscription lapse, and so I, I, did, I, didn't, I stopped getting them. But she has all the back issues. So I went through them all and decided I picked three. I really wanted to buy them all, but I needed to pull back. So I picked up uh, this one, which is the goat issue. <laughs> what a fabulous cover. Uh, Ply Magazine is an incredible publication. It's just this beautiful, you know, thick paper, beautiful pictures. Uh, there's not ads on every page. The advertisements, in, you know, I think, towards the back are just very discreetly put into the publication. And I picked up the, the goat one because I, I want to do a summer breed study on different goat breeds, see, uh, see what I can learn about, you know, pygoras, cashgoras, zangoras, uh, Orenburg, all those different kind of goats. So I picked this up. And then she also had this coveted issue of the basics, which uh, I understood this one sold out. Other one I picked up is the from summer of 2022, and this was the mix issue. Because uh, I'm interested in, um, you know, making different blends. There's a scarf it's woven out of hand spun. I'm interested in doing more blends on my hackle and my drum carter. So I thought this would be a nice book to have. So, yes, yeah, so those were my acquisitions for the week. And then, of course, while I was at the yarn shop, I couldn't leave without buying, you know, some fiber-related thing. And I picked up this skein sock yarn. This is called the Bee's Knees Socknado, 80% superwash, fine merino, 20% nylon, hand-dyed in Canada, made in Italy by ancient artsfiber.com. So I'm um, going to uh, cast this on as my next pair of socks. And then I bought this little mini. This mini is Uni Marin, uh, Merino Mini from Universal, I think it is. I get a lot of yarn is made in Turkey. This was made in Turkey. So yeah, I'm gonna use this for the heels, tufts, tuff, heels, tufts, and coes. <laughs> heels, tufts, and coes. I'm gonna use this for the heels, cuffs, and toes. And then this is only um, because of my big feet. Um, this is only 385 yards. So I thought maybe I should have that extra mini uh, just to make sure I have enough yarn to make the socks. So I'm not averse to using super wash wool, especially when it comes to socks. I, uh, and also, you know, it's, uh, I, I was, I couldn't resist the colorway. Just beautiful flecks of purples and magentas in there. And that gorgeous, gorgeous mustardy gold. It's so pretty. So yeah, so speaking of socks, I'll give you just a quick update on my uh, progress. It was so funny today. I was knitting uh, this morning. I was upstairs knitting on my square. And my 20-year-old says to me, Mom, he goes, every time I look at you, you're working on something different. <laughs> I mean, by now, you know, uh, the people I live with don't really pay that much attention to what I'm working on. But, you know, he notices that I'm always working on something different. I'm like, yeah, that's why I don't get anything done, which I thought was funny funny observation but I think last week I talked about I finished one sock this is a sock I made um, out of Sauber Ball crazy and um, yeah done with a sock blocker or anything 
I was really happy. The I think I've got Kitchener down now, which which was really no no problems with the Kitchener stitch on that that go round. And then I have my next one started. So yeah, I'm just doing a two by two rib. Um, I did a German twisted cast on, which gives a nice a nice stretchy cuff for the ribbing. And then I'm just going to um, knit the sock like I did this one. So yeah, this is my TV knitting, my car knitting. And uh, I'm not a real big project bag uh, gal. I don't really have any project bags except this one. This one's a matter root, I think, bag. And also in my bag I have my swatch cap. So I'm working on... Um, this little cap. I'm going to make the arboreal sweater by Jennifer Steingas, and I'm just using the leaf motif pattern to make a hat. And this is out of this is out of hand spun CVM. This is a, like a gray, and this is a uh, beautiful chocolatey uh, dark dark brown, brownish black. And I'm making good progress. I'm just going to do two, uh, the two repeats of the of the leaves, leaves, and then just do some, you know, some quick decreases uh, for the top, and hopefully, hopefully it'll fit me. I cast on 104 stitches. I'm getting uh, five stitches per inch, and I'm knitting this on a US seven, I think, four and a half. Yeah, four and a half millimeter. And I increased to 100. I started with 104. I added six to get 110 because the, this is a 10, 10 stitch repeat here. So I have got that underway, working on that. Let's see what else? Whoops. Yeah, and then the, the only other thing I've been working on is I've been continuing to make my um, blended top on my hackle. So last week I did a little video at the end where I uh, showed you how I was making some uh, pulled top from my hackle, and I'm working my way through a gradient uh, braid. And see, this uh, it's going to go from light to dark. So I've got quite a bit here. I've got some spun up on a spindle, but uh, I'm just going to go ahead and continue to make that comb top that uh, pulled roving. And then the other thing I've been working on is um, uh, I've been spinning, I've been blending some uh, wool with uh, Angora Bunny. So I, I, I've already showed this in a previous episode. This is uh, some Corydale blended with Angora. And then this, I made another bat. This is fin wool, a gray fin uh, with a gray angora. So I'm doing the gray fin with angora. I, I imagine I, I'm not real. I'm not weighing out anything. I'm just um, going by feel. I'm probably ending up with like a five, maybe five percent, five to ten percent of angora. And I want to spin this up. Um, I was thinking of socks, but I don't, uh, I don't know if it would be very uh, appropriate since it's pretty soft. And I found this basket, <laughs> I found this basket at my local Aldi, and it's for pet toys. And um, I'm a sucker for any kind of container because <laughs> I'm always looking for something to put my fiber in. So... Uh, is you, if you've been watching my channel for a while, usually I have my big wheel back here. I have a uh, Lendrum Saxony. Uh, I think it was one of the one of the first Sax Saxony wheels that Gordon Lendrum made because if it's not a double drive, it's a single drive. And I it was a new to me. It had been previously owned, and I actually brought it upstairs. Excuse me, drop stuff. I brought it upstairs to do some uh, spinning in my my front room. Has 
a beautiful morning sun because it's got an eastern exposure. So I brought my wheel up there and uh, later today I'm going to get um, back uh, reacquainted. Reacquaint it's like a pillow, you guys. <laughs> I'm going to get reacquainted with my, uh, my big wheel. I haven't spun on it in ages. I'm going to uh, wax it up and give it a good oil and do some spinning. And I will include um, some of that video here at the end of my video. Because I know I get a lot of feedback that you enjoy uh, watching me spin. And uh, I love spinning too. So, All right. I think I'm going to close this for today, friends. Uh, thank you so much for being here, for your continued support, uh, for all your kind comments and encouragement. Um, I, I, I value each and every one of you so much. Uh, you can reach me um, through Instagram. I'm The Soulful Spinner on Instagram. I'm also The Soulful Spinner on Ravelry. You can PM me there, private message me there. Uh, if you don't do either of those and you want to connect with me, you can connect with me via email. I'm soulfulspinning at gmail.com. So feel free to reach out to me. Uh, let me know how you're doing. I love hearing from you, and um, yeah, I just hope you're doing really well, and I thank you so much for um, coming into this, to this place of my little spinning universe. All right, friends, I will be back next week for a summary, a summary episode of all the breeds that I worked with this winter, and I'll show you all my finished squares and give you some thoughts and reflections on that, and then, uh, yeah, move on from there. So take care, everybody, and I will see you again next weekend. Have a great week. Bye for now.